What did Sonny Dykes say in his press conference on Tuesday? Could we see some new players get some more snaps against Nickel State on Saturday? Also, we'll break down uh, Nickel State. Who are some players to watch for them? Frogs get a new commit for the 2024 class. All that and more coming up next. It's Locked On Horn Frogs. You are Locked On Horn Frogs. Your daily podcast on the TCU Horn Frogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. That's right, Locked On Horn Frogs, your team every day. I'm your host, Steven Zimcock. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, we're getting, well, we're getting closer to 1,000 subscribers, which is really cool. Uh, please also subscribe on Spotify, Apple, wherever it is you get podcasts in its audio form. You can rate the show or view the show. Um, we're going to talk in a minute about Sonny Duck's press conference from Tuesday. What are some of the things he said? How is he going to get this team on the right track as they get ready to take on Nickel State? Uh, today we're brought to you by Game Time. I'll talk to you more about Game Time later, but it's a great – app. Um, it's the best place to get tickets on the secondary market. They have really good deals right now. You can get tickets for the Nickel State game for as low as $4. Um, and so if you need tickets to this game this weekend or any TCU event, concert, comedy show, whatever it might be, download the Game Time app today. Use the promo code Lockdown College and get uh, $20 off your first order. So Sonny Dykes talked to the media on Tuesday. What do you have to say about the team? Obviously trying to turn the page now, moving forward to play Nickel State and uh, continuing the season. He was asked about the tackling issues against Colorado on Friday. How did they address that? He says we've tackled on Sunday and also tackled today. So um, doing some more full contact practices. You know, tackling is really just effort and energy. You can, you can practice it and get it right. Uh, and I know everybody wants to like, okay, let's get, let's start doing the Oklahoma drill. Let's just really get after it from contact standpoint. Um, you have to be physical in practice, but at the same time, like they're pretty smart and pretty measured about how much they're pushing these guys. I realize some people might see that as a problem, um, but I know they have pretty concrete data that backs up like the workload they're trying to put on e an individual players based on what they're doing in practice each and every day. Uh, but honestly, a lot of Colorado was just taking bad angles, not wrapping up. Uh, you just have to commit to it. Like the defense is going to have to commit to getting guys to the ground and running through people, you know, getting that helmet on the outside uh, shoulder, other side of the body, and driving through people and getting them to the ground. Um, and it's easier said than done because dudes are fast and athletic. And honestly, they probably saw some of the best athletes they're going to see when it comes to that game against Colorado they have on Saturday. But, um, yeah, hopefully the team does better. If, if they would have just done fundamental things on defense, like we talk a lot about Joe Gillespie in a scheme. And I guess this part of it also falls on him to a certain extent. But if they would have just done basic, like, tackling, executing their responsibilities, um, they wouldn't have played a great football game, but probably would have won that football game because they were, you know, multiple first downs on that first touchdown drive to open the game when Colorado jumped out 7 nothing, where they had a chance to get uh, Colorado off the field on third down and just couldn't get guys to the ground. And then, of course, the one that stands out most in my mind was that Long screen pass to Dylan Edwards. Well, it wasn't a it wasn't a long pass. It was just a little screen pass. But first guy overran the play, and then a couple more missed tackles led to a touchdown. So that's frustrating. Got to get that cleaned up. And I know the coaching staff has been working on that. He sounded pretty irritated when he answered that question. I don't think at the question, but just at the idea that he knows they struggled to do that, and that's basic, you know, football one hundred and one. That's just something that you can't um, you can't fail at if you're going to be a good football team. And then uh, he was asked about point of emphasis heading into this week, and he just said biggest thing is having a killer mentality and mindset. That's what they've talked about. Um, and he he talked about how college football is different than it used to be with the transfer portal. Now everybody has dudes, and we we've, we've seen it in action really across the Big 12 this week, right? Like Texas State completely overhauled their roster. G.J. Kenny, their coach, a really young, good coach, came over from Incarnate Word, brought in, I think, 50-plus transfers. And the Bobcats went into Waco and they beat Baylor. Uh, you know, Wyoming at home against Texas Tech, they took down the Red Raiders. There's just – there's talent everywhere now because uh, there's so much freedom of movement and guys are immediately eligible – and you have to be ready each and every week. And he talked about that after the game. You know, I, 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 try, to, I try to make an effort, I really do, uh, to be pretty measured about this stuff, to not be a total homer and just be overly positive about things, but also to not be doom and gloom and super negative about everything. Um, they can fix this stuff. Like, 
most college football teams lose a game that they should, right? And and honestly, we might look back on this in six or seven weeks and see what Colorado's doing and, and say, okay, well, that wasn't – I mean, it was a game they could have won. It was a game they probably should have won. Um, but Colorado stacked up some wins now, and that loss doesn't look as bad as it did after the first week of the season. But uh, in a lot of instances, like you see college football teams – drop a game that they shouldn't. Now, TCU did it at the first of the year, which doesn't leave them much margin for error moving forward if they're going to accomplish their goals. But everything is still in front of them. Um, so they can get this done. And it all feels very – like we're in a vacuum. We're obsessed with with this school, with this university, with the program. And so everything feels really heightened. But at, at the end of the day, it's one game. There's a chance to bounce back. It starts by getting focused and playing well against Nickel State. And last season, it, it's surprising because last season they didn't do this. Like they had losses, but honestly, there weren't many, there weren't, I guess, any games other than the Big 12 Championship where uh, you felt like they should go in there and, and win. And they just got beat by a team that wasn't up to their standard, right? And there were games where they sort of slept walk through the first half and didn't get it done, but. They, they found a way to, to pull it out and make plays when they had to and win the football game, and they just didn't do that on Saturday. And, you know, I, I know everybody's upset with Joe Gillespie right now, and they're calling for a job. Um, they want schematic changes. Like, Joe Gillespie did a pretty good job last year, and the end of the season was rough, and the start of the season has been rough, but I don't think this is a guy that's just completely forgotten how to coach. He knows, like, he knows what has to happen here. Now, he has to adjust. He has to figure out um, what the plan is, but – I, I think some changes will be made. I don't think it'll be wholesale changes. I don't think it'll be the type of changes that maybe everybody wants to see. Uh, but I, I feel like they're going to try to come with some counter punches here to catch up to what people are doing to them. Speaking of changes on the defense, he was asked about Rick DeBrew, who had a sack on Saturday. He said he liked how Rick played. He was happy with it. And then he was asked if that was a guy he could see playing more. And he said, yeah, like a lot of guys, as they continue to make plays, then they'll get more reps. Um, and he went on to talk about Abe Kamara as well, as a guy that might play more. He said, same way with everybody, really. It's not any different with any position. We didn't play well. We didn't tackle well, particularly on the back end. I think those guys need to perform better, or there'll be somebody else playing in front of them. Um, so pretty blunt there. Like, if, if these guys don't figure it out, then there's going to be some changes, and some other players will get more snaps. Now, that being said, I don't think we're going to look out there this weekend and see four or five new starters on the field. Maybe we do. Maybe that's the message that they want to send. Um, but I, I think overall, these a lot of these players have experience. They're guys that played well for them last year. They're going to give them chances. Um, and we've discussed some of the ways that they're struggling right now because they're getting asked to do things just athletically that they can't always do. Cover, you know, dynamic playmakers in space, and that's a hard ask for anybody. But um, – there's, there's talent on this defense. I think there's a chance that they can get this done, but they have to play cleaner. They have to play more fundamental football. Um, and the defensive staff has to look at the film and start to understand and, and you know, bounce ideas off each other and figure out, like, okay, why? how are people trying to attack us? What's going on? But a clear message from Sonny Dykes here that, hey, this is not last year's group, right? Like, we're not uh, – there's no lifetime achievement award that somebody's going to get. Like if, if you're not making plays um, and other guys are, then we're going to give those players reps. But uh, if these young guys get opportunities, they're going to take advantage of them. And, and Rick was a, a player at defensive end last week that took advantage of the chances that he had. And, um, you know, that's, that's a great – you want a deep defensive line that can switch in and out and make plays. And so hopefully – that's something um, that they can do. He was also asked about the receiving core um, and guys that stood out to him. Ten different players caught the ball on Saturday. I was I was hard on the receivers yesterday on the podcast. I just felt like they didn't make a huge impact on the game. Brian Capers brought up a good point that I'll talk about later on in the show. Um, but really, Jared Wiley was and J.P. Richardson were the, the two guys that made an impact. But he didn't mention those players. I think he's certainly impressed with what they did. He actually mentioned um, Jack Besh. It was kind of intriguing – what he said about Jack, uh, he just said he's been very consistent. He's one guy that stands out in the fact that he's been available every day. He's got a great worth, work ethic. You know what you're going to get every day out of him in practice. Um, and quarterbacks are looking for someone they can trust, and they know where he's going to be and when he's going to be there. Um, and he, he mentioned again that Jack Besh has been practicing every day. So I don't, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes there. I'm not sure if he's sending a message to some other receivers that haven't been available. Um, but he just likes the fact that in Besh, honestly, he missed the spring because 
of an injury, but he's been available every day in fall camp. Um, and he's a weapon. I mean, he was a freshman All-American at LSU, didn't exactly know how they were going to use him. Uh, they dumped it out to him a few times on Saturday, but he's one of those inside slot guys slash tight end type players that I think can make a big impact. Now, my question is, you've got some players on the inside between Jared Wiley, J.P. Richardson. I'd love to see JoJo Earl get more involved starting this week. Um, Besh, who, who's the player on the outside? Like, Savion didn't have his best – effort on Saturday. Hopefully he can get more involved. Um, Cordell Russell, I don't think played – if he played any snaps, it wasn't very much. But who's the player on the outside that's going to step up? He also mentioned Jalen Robinson, though. He said he wanted to get Robinson more involved, that he had a great fall camp and a good practice today. Um, and as you see guys start to develop more, they'll become more of a focal point of the offense. One guy on the outside I do need to mention is Dalen Wright. Dalen had a, a nice game. Only had two catches for 44 yards. One of them was touchdown, though. And honestly, if Chandler hits Dalen – on a, I guess it was probably a post pattern where he was streaking past midfield and he had like two steps on a defender. If he hits him in stride, that might have been a touchdown, but it was at least probably, you know, a ball that would have gotten them down in the red zone, a pass that would have gotten them in scoring range at a place where they could have uh, either tied it up or, or taken the lead. So um, I think there's some talent in that room. You just got to find guys that are going to step up and make plays. But he apparently really likes what Jack Besh has brought to the table, mainly from a availability standpoint. Uh, and, and so hopefully Jalen Robinson, another one of those guys he mentioned, is a player that they can uh, they can get more involved. Jalen was open. Well, it was a it was a contest. It would have been a contested catch, but he ran down um, the sideline and had a, a ball in the end zone. It might have been Chandler's best throw of the day. I mean, it was a dime. Like he dropped it in the bucket, uh, and Jalen had it. But then as he was going to the ground, Travis Hunter got his hand in there and knocked the ball out. Also, the ground kind of separated the ball from uh, from him. But that would have been an amazing catch. We'll see if he's someone that they try to get more involved in the system as they move forward. So uh, we'll talk more about Nickel State in segment two and what Coach Dykes had to say about them. Who are some players on that team that could challenge TCU? They have some talent, too. Um, again, age of the transfer portal, they're always going to see some, some dudes on each and every team. Also, uh, this news sort of got buried because it happened on Friday right before – the Colorado game, but uh, TCU got a new commit, a JUCO safety. We'll talk about him next. This is Lockdown Horn Frogs. Speaking of adding talent, adding players to your roster, adding talent to your team at work, uh, if you own a small business, you know that finding good employees is the most important part of your job. Like you have to have good, reliable people on your team that you can designate responsibility to and feel good about what they uh, what they can bring to the table. Go to linkedin.com slash college and you can post your job for free. Um, you can add your job to their uh, hashtag hiring frame and spread the word that you're hiring on your LinkedIn profile. They have simple tools like screening questions, make it easy to focus on the candidates with just the right skills so you can quickly prioritize who you need to hire. That's important, man. If you're sitting there and you're having to sift through a bunch of different applications and resumes and you're like, oh, I don't know if this person's going to be a good fit, come up with some simple screening questions, some just like these are hard and fast rules. We can't negotiate on this. So you can find out, okay, these are the you know, five to ten people that I need to call, I need to talk to, um, and that I need to make a priority in contacting. Uh, small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. I've told you before, everybody knows what LinkedIn is. That name is synonymous with hiring. It's synonymous with people looking for work. Um, and it's where you need to go if you're trying to get people on your team. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions do apply. Don't waste your time with another job board site. Use LinkedIn. They're the best, and they are a sponsor of the Locked On Network. So, yeah, some news that I feel bad talking about it on a Wednesday because I actually saw it on Twitter on Friday, but uh, obviously I didn't – well, I did a show Saturday night. It was about the news of the day, though, which was that Colorado TCU game, um, and I didn't have a chance. I was working a high school game Friday night, so I didn't have a chance to post any sort of instant reaction to this, but Frog's got to commit on uh, Friday evening, and it was Jair Smith, a JUCO safety um, from San Mateo College, and he actually got rated by um, 247 Sports uh, this weekend. So he debuted in the 247 rankings this weekend. 
Um, and he is a top 10 player in the JUCO ranks. It says Smith comes in as the number seven JUCO prospect in the country and number two safety. He's a three star with an 87 rating. Those ratings are out of 100. Um, long, rangy player, 6'1, 183 pounds. Here's the important part range, versatility at that size, makes plays, makes plays in coverage. Blitzes off the edge. He can line up more in the box and be an extra run defender from what we have seen in his high school film and even has some experience as a boundary corner. And so this has been the MO for TCU and this defensive staff since Joe Gillespie took over. They want long, rangy guys on the outside, also at those safety positions. But you need versatile players in the 3-3-5. Like if you're going to have five guys on the back end, you need guys that can come up and be in run support, which is something that Smith has done at the high school level. He also played some corner on the outside of the high school level um, and then has the ability to play in coverage, play at that safety position, uh, 6'1", you know, 185 pounds. He definitely looks the part from a physical standpoint. Um, it says he's a, a new age hybrid type defender who can line up in a variety of schemes and roles, makes plays on special teams too. And in his first game for San Mateo College, this weekend he had a pick six. And so um, this is a guy that has a chance to kind of, you know, move up the rankings uh, as he continues to play a Juco schedule this year, get some good competition, but had a pick six in that first game, has the ability to play in the box um, and just kind of around the line of scrimmage and make plays there as well. So super exciting that he's part of the fold here, uh, a new safety, um, Jair Smith from San Mateo College, good pickup by, uh, the TCU coaching staff. And, you know, one thing that I've noticed about this staff um, that is really impressive, they they find guys just about everywhere. Like the JUCO ranks are, are one area of um, the college football landscape where it's it's been really tough for those guys to find landing spots because uh, since COVID um, it gave everybody extra eligibility and then with the transfer portal, I mean, obviously, like if, if coaches are kind of looking at the big picture and they're like, okay, I can go get a player from the JUCO ranks or I can go find, you know, a player with Power 5 experience. Well, in most cases, they're probably going to gravitate towards the guy that's played, even if he hasn't played a lot, at that uh, larger level of football. But there's still talent, you know, at the junior college level. And um, Mason White and Channing Kanda were two corners that they went and got from the JUCO ranks uh, this past offseason that were rated really highly. Kanda was the number one corner um, in JUCO football last year. And now Jair Smith, uh, may, he, he's going to be part of this team as well. And a lot of that is, is um, spearheaded by Jeff Jordan, who's the assistant athletic director for player personnel. And they featured uh, Jeff in a story last year. He's a really good sounding board for Sonny. He's a former head coach. And so he's just someone that Sonny can kind of bounce ideas off of um, in general during a game and, and kind of has a feel for, okay, what do we need to do here? What decisions do we have to make? Um, what does the data say? But then also he's just really good at scouting and finding guys, whether it's in the portal, whether it's in the high school ranks, and this is the new world of college football. Um, you're constantly having to evaluate guys at all levels of football to try to put your roster together and, uh, you know, find talented people. But I know everybody wants, like, the can't-miss five-star guys, and I would not be upset at all if TCU started landing some of those. And they have some highly rated players in their recruiting class. Actually um, had some players that got uh, ratings recently, uh, and now they're 38th overall, I believe. Yeah, 38th overall class on 247 Sports. But some of those guys that they were kind of in on early, Wesley Harvey, um, the offensive tackle from Oklahoma, and then uh, – Ladanian Fields, the um, athlete, they'll probably play him in the secondary from Oklahoma City, are both now three-star prospects according to 247 Sports. So, um, yeah, still finding talent at different levels. But Jair Smith is um, a big-time name. I mean, again, number seven player in the junior college ranks, um, number two safety in the country in the junior college ranks, and is looking to have a big season there at San Mateo College. Okay, what do we need to know about Nickel State, the team? Um, they played their first game of the season against Sacramento State uh, last week, lost that game 38-24. Sac State is the number 10 team in the country in the FCS ranks. So they're a really good football team at that level. Um, probably one of the better teams they're going to play at the FCS level this year and stayed competitive in that game. 
Um, lost by a couple touchdowns. Their quarterback is Pat McQuaid. Uh, he's originally from Ohio, and as is typical in the transfer portal era, he's kind of bounced around all over the place. He was at Kent State. He was actually a redshirt quarterback there. Um, and then last season he was at Mississippi Gulf Coast and had a really good season. Um, 2,730 yards passing, 24 touchdowns, a 64% completion percentage, and a 154.8 passer, passer efficiency rating. Led the nation in passing yards per game and passing touchdowns and was third in the country in completion percentage. So I had a really good year at Mississippi Gulf Coast, then transferred over to Nickel State. Um, had an okay game in game one of the season, uh, 196 yards, 50% completion percentage. So not super efficient, one touchdown, one sack, or one INT, was sacked three times. So gave the ball away once, did throw one touchdown. Sonny Dykes said um, in his press conference Tuesday that he really likes McQuaid. He's a dude that can extend plays. Um, he mentioned that he's a left-handed quarterback, and he, you know, can break out of the pocket and get things done. Um, and he also mentioned Quincy Brown, Quincy, uh, played for TCU last season. We thought he might be a guy in that receiver room who could step up and make a big impact this year. That didn't really come to fruition, uh, but he is there on this roster. And then they have a, a really good outside linebacker, hybrid defensive end, uh, Kershawn Fisher, um, who played at Louisiana Tech the first three seasons of his career. Uh, he's originally from New Orleans, Louisiana, but at La Tech uh, in three seasons had 41 tackles, six tackles for loss, two sacks, five hurries, and one forced fumble um, in 2022. And so he was all over the field for the Bulldogs um, over a few years there. Again, played his high school ball in New Orleans, listed at 6'3", 240. But Sonny said he's a guy that can play just about anywhere in the country. So that's a name to know, Kershawn Fisher, outside linebacker, um, defensive end. He wears – uh, number 20 for Nichols, and he had an interception in their first game of the season. So you see that he's a guy that plays um, just about everywhere, had a pick, uh, had two tackles total, um, and is a, is a guy that can stand up on the edge, maybe put his hand on the ground, also cover. So pretty versatile player there uh, for them. Um, and, you know, it's what you expect, like, some some talent, but honestly, it's a game where TCU should be able to take care of business and get things done. And I wonder what you guys think, and you can let me know in the YouTube comments. I know I mentioned earlier, like, what do you want to see from this football game? Um, and somebody said, well, I just want to see him put up, like, 80 points uh, or 70-plus 70, 70 points, I guess is what they said. And, and we'll see if that happens. But it's kind of an interesting case because typically, like in this game, you would want to get some of your younger guys' snaps. But I do wonder with the game last week and how it, how it played out and the fact that Chandler is still sort of learning, um, is it more beneficial to get these guys, you know, he started a lot of reps. Now, if you're if it's in the fourth quarter and the thing's out of hand, you don't want to be playing your stars anymore because then you're talking about in, injury risk and that type of thing. But, um, yeah, this is your last chance to get guys some opportunities before you start Big 12 play because you got that kind of odd game against Houston um, in the middle of September before the SMU game this season. But that's a look at Nickel State and sort of what they bring to the table from a talent perspective. When we come back, um, we'll talk about some of the reaction from yesterday's show. I talked with Matt Jennings uh, about the team and where they're at um, and wanted to hear from you guys. And so I'll read some of those reactions here in a moment. This is Lockdown Horn Frogs, your team every day. I started the show talking about Game Time. Game Time app. Um, they have a promo code locked on college. You can get twenty dollars off your first purchase uh, if you go browse around the Game Time app now. If you need tickets for this TCU Nickel State game, you can get them for as low as four or five dollars. And you might think, well, what kind of seats are those? The great thing about the Game Time app is you open that app up and it tells you exactly. It gives you a picture of where your seats are and what it looks like relative to the field. I know there's uh, some in that end zone section for four dollars, and then up in that 400 level um, as well, but even some in like the 200 level on uh, the side where the band is um, for like six, seven bucks. And so there's some good opportunities to get seats. Uh, they have flash deals and last minute tickets. There's a way you can just swipe and get the cheapest tickets available and some tickets uh, where the price has gone down because people are trying to get rid of them. So you don't have to plan months in advance. Um, if you don't have tickets yet, that's fine. You can still get them. Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. 
Uh, and the game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. Get images of your seats before you buy. As I told you earlier, they have pictures where you can see exactly where your seat is, what your view is going to be. Um, you can buy tickets in a matter of seconds, just two taps and you're set and they're sent directly to your phone. So you never have to dig through your email. OK, do I need to put them in my wallet? All those things. No, it's just directly your phone and you can use them. Uh, snag the tickets without the, without the stress with game time. Download the game time app and create an account. Use the promo code Locked On College. For $20 off your first purchase, again, uh, $20 off your first purchase if you download the Game Time app and use the promo code Locked On College today. So I was asking you guys, um, you know, just about concerns for this group, right? Like, what what are we thinking coming off that loss to Colorado? Um, Chris Jacobson chimed in on YouTube and he said, I think most problems are on defense. 22 missed tackles. Offense looked encouraging. They were pretty balanced. Chandler distributed the ball. Um, the fact that he found two white jersey defenders in the end zone is harsh. If we had won a close game, we would have viewed it differently. Yeah, those are all fair points. I mean, I think the offense played well. Can't give up the ball, as you said. It's just those are killers, right? Um, can't have turnovers. Can't have pre-snap penalties. That's going to hurt this football team. Um, so they got to clean that stuff up. Defensively, though, more glaring issues. Uh, but as as you said, and as I said, like if they just found a way to kind of make some tackles in space, I think they would have been okay. Um, Zoom play who frequently listens, and I appreciate him. Uh, did I hear Johnny Hodges' interview? It was very emotional, um, and he he says I, I wouldn't want to play TCU now after that game against Colorado because he thinks the team is refocused. And ready to go. And he says, well, after have to now for Colorado to win the Pac-12. Um, yeah, I saw Johnny's interview, and he was uh, – it was good. Like, he was defending Joe Gillespie. I think he was trying to put a lot of responsibility on the players. It was clear that he took that loss um, difficultly, and, and that's something that's been weighing on them. So now it's just all about how they respond. I mean, again, like, they're, everything's still in front of them. They can turn this around and get it done. Uh, they just got to go do it. Um a loco man said Alabama and Georgia have outer worldly D lines. That's why the three, three, five works. He's afraid Gillespie will be too hard headed for his own good. Uh, yeah. I mean, I could see that obviously like Georgia and Alabama also run different versions of the three, three, five. Uh, and so they'll have some more guys. They'll have some four man sets where they have four men on the line. Again, I'll just say like this scheme is not, uh, there's some frustrating things about it. There is about any defense. Um, I don't think putting another dude on the line is just some magic way to get more pressure, but I understand why people are frustrated with only bringing three. It's just as simple as you don't have the numbers advantage. I, I honestly think the key is more, more pressure from different angles. Like that is one of the things about this defense that uh, makes it difficult. And, and Matt was talking about this in the run game yesterday. It's, it's hard for offensive lines to block this odd front because since everybody's not up on the line, um, like they typically would be, it's difficult for offensive linemen sometimes to understand, okay, where is where are people coming from? Where's the run support coming from? What's my responsibility? If I don't have someone head up on me or on my outside or inside shoulder and I get a free release to the second level, who do I go get? Uh, and it allows these linebackers and safeties to kind of play freer and come downhill. Uh, and, and so I just like to see some more of that in the passing game, like try to confuse uh, the pass protection and confuse the quarterback by bringing pressure. And I just don't think the, the delayed blitzes have been working. And so have to change that up and, and give the uh, offense some different looks. Uh, Blake Murphy said, TCU never really ever came going three and out on the first drive. They allowed Colorado to score that first touchdown. And then Colorado also got the ball first in the third quarter uh, and scored. And he wished they would have um, been more committed to the run game. Yeah, I, I get that. I wish they would have committed to the run more too. And that's a good point about Colorado scoring first. I mean, that immediately did put some pressure on TCU. And uh, you hate that that third and three on the first drive, just it's a miscommunication there. I'm not sure where Chandler was trying to throw, but um, didn't have a receiver really in the area. So uh, you got to capitalize on on opportunities and, and score. Um, CFB fan said offense showed a lot of flashes, just need to clean stuff up. Defense, he didn't see a single thing he liked. Hard to disagree with that. They got to clean things up on defense for sure. Um, Kevin Bell said, depends on if Gillespie stops with his bend, but don't break nonsense. You can't run a 3 3 5. You have to send a 4 3 or a 5 guy from somewhere and play tighter on coverage. Um, yeah, we talked about that. I mean, I think it's about bringing pressure, uh, and you don't have to always hide that pressure. Like, I feel like you can sort of declare 
where that pressure is coming from and still be effective. Uh, Brian Caper said, we forget that Quentin Johnson was almost non-existent until his breakout against Kansas. Yeah, that's a good point. I was hard on the receivers yesterday, and you bring up a good point that Quentin Johnson didn't have a great start to his season last year from a productivity standpoint, but then he really broke out. Uh, but I think the, the thing I'll say about Quentin is he didn't break out early because teams were just double teaming him, and that allowed other guys to have opportunities. And so – Without him on the field, things are just different now. And somebody's going to have to find a way to win some one-on-one matchups and loosen up the de- defense. And Big Easy said um, – he said this once before. He says TCU is trying to be an elite team with a bunch of three-star players. It's not going to happen. He says Georgia showed them and now Colorado. Um, I mean, I, I get your point, but honestly, like, from a – I know this is not the end-all be-all, but if we're talking about just, like, rankings – 247 puts out a talent composite every year, and TCU was higher on the talent composite than Colorado. Like, they were number 19. Colorado was number 34. Now, TCU doesn't have, you know, a former number one player in the nation like Travis Hunter. They actually got a guy who was number two in the nation and Tommy Brockermeyer, but he didn't play um, on Saturday, and I'm not sure how much he's going to play this season. He's an offensive tackle, so his impact on the game, even if he does get in there, it's obviously going to be different. Uh, but Colorado had some really good skilled players. And they use those guys effectively. I think TCU has the talent to compete with just about anybody, uh, but they have to play a cleaner game and they have to find ways to adjust to what teams are trying to do to them. Um, thank you for all the reactions. Thank you for watching the show today. It's Locked on Horn Frogs. We'll be back tomorrow. Your team every day.